Om Lakhani. He's a consultant endocrinologist at the Zydus Hospital, Ahmedabad. And it's a pleasure always to hear him. That's why I think we're having him uh, twice in the last 14 days. <laughs> and uh, he needs no introduction. Uh, he was an alumni of the Baroda Medical College. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have him. He's going to speak on AMHM marker in infertility. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. You you have all the rights, ma'am. Uh, yeah. So, thank you for this uh, session, and I think it's always a pleasure to uh, talk in a cross speciality talk. I think it's always you know something. In fact, sitting there, I learned a lot in the previous talk, so I think it's very useful to my practice as well. So I think it's a uh, very useful thing. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I'm a very firm believer of the fact that, you know, uh, any innovation really comes from the bleeding edge of two specialities or multiple specialties. As you can clearly see, uh, infertility is the bleeding edge of multiple specialties. You know, you have so many specialties involved in the care of the patient. Uh, and then, you know, now you see a beautiful fertility outcome. So we are going to go to something very basic today. We are going to talk about AMH, that's the anti-Mullerian hormone. And we'll talk everything about it, uh, right from the uh, you know physiology uh, to the clinical laboratory medicine, as well as the clinical applications of the same. Okay, so let's talk about the physiology. So as the name suggests, it's the anti-Mullerian hormone. Uh, it's technically supposed to be useful in men. Uh, you know, and that's where its genesis really comes from. Now, as you can see, uh, by default, we are all destined to be women, right? But, you know, uh, nature takes a course a little bit sideways in certain people. Uh, well, 50% ideally. Uh, and there's a production of an AMH and testosterone. And what AMH does is it suppresses the Mullerian structures. So you have the, you know, as you can see, uh, the uh, pathway diverging. Uh, towards the male side and so, yeah sorry okay pointer is not working okay uh we have you know it going towards the male side and if nothing really you know if there's no amh early on then you have by default the mullerian structures which are produced which go towards the female now you know that you know there are two different cell lines in men both are extremely important for the male to really uh, you know be a male uh, you have the lyric cell, which produces the testosterone, uh, which goes on to produce the external genitalia. And the Sertoli cell, which produces the AMH, which suppresses the Mullerian structure, leading to the male internal genitalia, uh, you know, developing in the proper way. So this is the two things. But what's very important is, and we'll come to this again and again, uh, AMH is the marker of the Sertoli cell function. That's a very important thing in men. And though, of course, we are going to focus on female infertility, there are a few aspects of AMH in the male infertility as well, which I'd like to really touch upon. Perhaps, uh, you know, topic for future research. Now, what really happens if there is no AMH in men? Well, you have a condition which is known as the persistent Mullerian duct syndrome. So if you have AMH, if you don't have AMH, and if you have testosterone, you have the male external genitalia, but the internal female genitalia, the Mullerian structures are still persistent, right? So you see this rare condition. Uh, we do see this in clinical practice. It's a rarity. It's a unicorn, you can say. Uh, if you don't have either the testosterone or the Leydig cell or the Sertoli cell function in an 46XY, then you have a female uh, genitalia. And that is what is you know known as, well, it's it's the complete gonadal dysgenesis. And you have the female external genitalia, which happens. So this, this And they later on come with primary uh, infertility and primary amenorrhea. Uh, and that's what, you know, the the male version of the Turner or 46XY version of the Turner. That is what it is. Okay. What about female? Now, what happens is female? That is what we are going to focus mainly in the rest of our talk. Now, AMH, remember, in men, it is secreted early at, as early as about eight to nine weeks because it carries out a very critical function at that point of time. But in women, AMH is secreted at about 36 weeks of life. So it is secreted at a much later time. Uh, the levels start increasing from birth up to childhood. The peak is reached at around 15 years of age. It remains stable up till 25 and then starts declining gradually over a period of time, right? As you can see from the 
uh, graph over here, right? And I think this pretty well correlates also with the fertility as well, right? So, you know, you have that young women who fit into the perfect AMH zone, but of course the fertility is also pretty good. What cells produce AMH in women? And I think this is the, uh, you know, important chart here. Remember, AMH is produced, is produced by the granulosa cell of pre-entral and small enteral follicles. And 60% of this is produced by uh, follicles which are between 5 to 8 mm in size. That's the critical period. And more than 10 mm follicles do not produce AMH, right? So as it evolves, the production of AMH kind of starts reducing. So you have mainly the early small pre-entral follicles and enteral follicles which produce the AMH. Now, the idea of AMH and what's the purpose? What's the main role of AMH? Well, AMH is the nature's, you know, anti-OHSS thing, right? It prevents multiple follicles from uh, developing at the same time simultaneously. So what it does is it allows the dominant follicle to evolve, but at the same time suppressing the other ones from developing, right? That's the main idea, right? So you don't want, you know, too many of them evolving at the same time leading to OHSS. That's the idea. We sometimes, you know, uh, do bypass that system, what we are doing in fertility. But the idea is the nature's own way of having a single uh, singleton pregnancy. That's the ultimate outcome. Uh, it also prevents the early follicles from atresia. So it maintains a good pool for further development, right? So it's basically what it's doing is it's it's like the nature's babysitter, right? It's preventing the babies from, you know, moving out of the house, keeping them in and keeping them happy, right? When the mom comes home, right, you have things are fine. Okay. Remember, uh, by puberty, 95% of the follicles are lost in girls, right? So that's, you know, you have a rapid atresia and you need this uh, nature's babysitter to keep them, uh, the remaining ones in check. Now, there's a very interesting dynamic happening between the, uh, you know, the uh, various other hormones of the body. So the FSH, it stimulates the AMH production. FSH also stimulates the estrogen production. But AMH and estrogen are not friends uh, for a lot of time. So estrogen inhibits the AMH, right? So this is a cycle which goes on, right? At different parts of the, uh, you know, female reproductive cycle, you have different dynamics in play. But I think this picture really tells you that there is FSH both directly stimulates AMH, but at the same time indirectly inhibits its production. So there's a very interesting uh, dynamic in play over here. And what about LH? Now, LH also does not have a direct impact on the AMH. But LH suppresses the AMH receptor. So it has an indirect action uh, by which it kind of, you know, bypasses. Now, technically speaking, uh, how much of this is important at this point of time in female reproductive cycle, we don't know, right? A lot of these are coming from, uh, you know, uh, from mainly rodent studies and so on. But the idea is that the more we understand this, because I think, you know, what we are going, what is going to happen now is that more products are going to develop from the field of AMH. So you'll have either AMH agonist or AMH antagonist and other things being developed in terms of fertility because this is an area of active research for a lot of people. Now let's look at the biochemistry side of it, the AMH assay. Now, does it require a particular time of the day or does it require a particular time in the cycle? The answer is actually no. You can measure it any time of the day. Well, we prefer measuring it in the morning time, but really does not matter, right? I mean, it could be part of your you know rest of the uh, tests which you're doing as a part of your fertility panel, but you can do it separately when the patient just walks into your clinic as well. It can be measured during any part of the menstrual cycle. And these two points actually make it a very attractive test. In the sense, you know, when the patient walks in any time of the day, right, afternoon consultation, morning consultation, doesn't matter, right, fasting, non-fasting, doesn't matter, doesn't, the timing of the cycle doesn't matter. You just take the sample and run the test, right? That's the beauty of doing an AMH. And that's why I think it, it it's, there are practical aspects which often make uh, this test is a very attractive test, perhaps in the future. It's mainly done, but commercial essays are mainly done by Eliza Klyer. Uh, what is important is you have to understand what essay is being used by your lab. Remember, the cutoffs are still not standardized. I'll come to this point again and again, right? So always look under the hood, uh, you know, and look at what essay is being used by your lab. Uh, what are the cutoffs? What are the, you know, fallacies of the essay and so on and so forth, right? Remember, a lot of your decision making is, I understand, based on AMH as well. And that's why it's very important to understand that essay. You know, when I'm like, for example, for an endocrinologist, you know, dealing with diabetes, you know, uh, HbA1c is extremely critical, right? And all my decisions are based on HbA1c. I need to know how my test is done, right? Without that, really, I'm, I'm uh, you know, not giving the full service to my patient. So the biggest challenge is actually lack of standardization. Of course, this is changing. Now, there's a lot of interest in this essay. A lot of companies are trying to make a standard essay. And the 
uh, you know, the uh, organizations which work towards this, uh, the reproductive endocrinology organizations are moving towards making this a standardized way. But at this point of time, there are different essays and all these essays do not cross talk and there is no standardization, right? So remember, that's one of the biggest challenges as far as, you know, the progress of AMH is concerned. Of course, this I am sure is going to be corrected very soon. There is a new developing essay, which is known as a PICO AMH. It's an ultra sensitive AMH, which is used, uh, you know, developed by Ench Lab. Uh, it's a US FDA approved uh, device, uh, you know, uh, essay for mainly for determination of menopausal status in women between ages of 42 to 62 years of age. Uh, remember, we already have ultra sensitive essays in other hormones, right? So you look at TSH, it's an ultra sensitive TSH. AMH is still lagging behind, but it's a relatively new essay, and now we are developing an ultra sensitive one. Uh, this is the only AMH test that is, uh, you know, useful to quantify the sensitivity and predict the uh, menopausal transition. So it's very important in that sense. Remember, you know, when you're perimenopausal, the levels of AMH will be lower and you need, hence you need an ultra sensitive essay. Uh, young women, it would make too much of a difference, right? And it is a, uh, you know, limit of detection of about 0.182 nanogram per ml, which is 1.3 picomol per liter. That's why it's called as a pico AMH because you detect up to one pico mole per, ml, uh, per liter, which is you know the reason why it is being used. The reason for pico AMH is that it will help improve our prediction of uh, menopausal status, and that is you know uh, useful not only for fertility outcomes but also in general as well. Uh, does the use and practical question uh, does the use of contraception have an impact on AMH level in women? Very important for you to understand because again you know we will be dealing with this group very common. Uh, Studies have shown, and I have given one reference below, that uh, hormonal contraception definitely does affect the AMH level. And you have, you know, uh, the use of combined occipils or vaginal ring and so on and so forth uh, does impact the AMH. AMH levels tend to be, uh, you know, lower in women who are using this contraceptive uh, systems, right? So you have to keep this in mind and again, interpret in the light of that uh, in that practical sense. Okay, let's look at the clinical applications of using of AMH. Let's talk with the, uh, well, the most important aspect today that is amh and the female fertility now very important point and i think this and you know if you don't take anything home today this is the one you should take home today can amh predict pregnancy outcome in women this is very important answer is no emphatically no right remember amh is a very good marker of ovarian reserve but it's not a marker for predicting fertility outcome or pregnancy outcome right pregnancy remember depends on many factors it's not just ovarian reserve right I'm sure this room is well versed with that. This distinction should be very clear because we often see patients being counseled with, you know, patients having very low AMH. Of course, you know, there will always be an urgency to, you know, uh, for pregnancy. Yes. But at the same time, we do not give them a negative prognostication in that sense. You know, you have low AMH, you have no hope, right? That is what we often hear, uh, which I think should be a no because women with very low AMH as well have delivered babies naturally, right? That's very important, right? So, uh, Remember that AMH is a marker of your, you know, ovarian reserve. It's not a marker of your fertility or pregnancy outcome. And that's something we should keep in mind. In fact, you know, this, this is what ACOG also uh, agrees. And they have given this as a case. And they've taken this case directly from ACOG. And there's a 26-year-old woman who comes to you in your clinic. And she says that she wants to become pregnant in the future. But right now, she wants to focus on her career, which is very true. Uh, she also mentions that a friend recently had a test to check her egg count and she wants to know how long she can wait to have a baby, right? A lot of patients come and ask, you know, uh, these things and she's basically talking about the AMH. Would you offer an AMH testing to her, right? She wants to know, you know, how long can I wait before I have my child? Now she's worried at the same time, but she wants to delay as much as possible. And a friend told me, why don't you go and check with your guy neck and she will offer you a test, which will help you find out. Well, for this particular purpose, ACOG committee opinion says do not use it, right? AMH should not be ordered to counsel women who are not infertile about their reproductive status and future fertility potential. Please do not use this, right? This is a wrong use for a very useful test. This is a wrong use, right? AMH should not be used in fertile women to predict pregnancy outcomes, to predict, to tell them, you know, when they can become pregnant and when they should not. This is, uh, well, the ACOG does not recommend that this should be used for this purpose because there's no data to suggest the same, right? The point being, right, use it in where it is strongly indicated. Uh, you know, that's the point. Okay. Of course, you know, like we discussed, ovarian reserve is not single factor. It depends on multiple factor. You have this AAFA model where it depends on the AMH, enterofollicular count, FSH level and aging. 
And you always look at multiple factors into consideration when you look at the ovarian reserve. So do not again rely just on one factor. Of course, you know, if you put a you know gun on my forehead and say, you know, use one, I'll use AMH. But it's not a single factor, right? There are also other factors which can be used in practice. Now, AMH and AFC ideally should be twins, but they're not. Uh, does AMH level always correlate with the follicular count? Answer is not always, right? It's very important to remember this. AMH can be produced by follicles less than 2 mm and they are GnRH independent, right? Remember, it's not dependent on this, you know, though FSH does control it, it's technically independent. Whereas the follicular count is measured, measures the follicles more than 2 mm in size and they are completely GnRH dependent, right? Now, in most cases, these are aligned, but in hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism in women, this is where there could be a dissociation, right? So this is where you look at it very carefully. So AMH may be normal, but AFC may be low, right? Because it's a GnRH independent and GnRH dependent, right? Uh, these women could have good fertility outcome with the use of, you know, ovarian stimulation. So again, you know, the point here is that though ideally both are aligned, right? They're not always aligned, especially when you're dealing with hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, you should really look at it in a more close way. Uh, we talked about this. We talked about Bologna criteria. Uh, you know, I'll not go into too much detail, but this is the ASHRAE's definition for poor ovarian reserve, and it's something which is very useful. So, advanced maternal age, uh, you know, a previous uh, poor, you know, ovarian reserve less than three oocytes, and abnormal follicular ovarian reserve testing that is less than five to seven follicles or AMH less than 0.5 to 1.1 is the Bologna criteria. This is an area in North Italy. Uh, those who are Formula One fans, uh, you know, uh, the Imola Grand Prix is just 30 minutes from here. This is where Ayrton Senna, the famous, you know, uh, you know, Formula One driver died. It's a very, you know, it's like a uh, mecca for Formula One fans, but also for, I think, fertility uh, also, right? Okay. So then you have, of course, the other criteria. You have the Poseidian criteria. I'll not go into too much details of these. You know, these are all, uh, you know, models created to predict the fertility outcome, predict the, you know, poor, poor ovarian reserve and so on. And I think, you know, you're all well versed with this. The point being that AMH is an important integral part of all these criteria. Uh, can AMH be used to, uh, you know, predict the response to controlled ovarian stimulation? This is important. Uh, Lee, in his study, has shown that uh, AMH more than 3.36, or typically, you know, if rounded off to 3.5, uh, there is increased risk of ovarian hyperstimulation with, you know, a sensitivity of 90% uh, and specificity of 80%, which means that, you know, uh, again, it's a very useful test to see whether you are going to deal with a, perhaps some, uh, you know, miscalculations could occur, right? And Lee also found that if the AMH baseline is less than 1.08, again, one, I think, would be the uh, rough number to use. It's associated with poor, uh, you know, control ovarian stimulation outcome with 85% sensitivity and 78% specificity. And of course, a meta-analysis uh, also done uh, by ESHRAE and, you know, uh, related bodies have also, you know, kind of uh, endorsed this. They said that uh, AMH is very important as a good baseline test to predict the power of the response, both high and low response to control ovarian stimulation. So this is, I think, this is the pillar of AMH. This is where it's most useful in, uh, you know, a fertility setup. Uh, like I said, ASHRAE does endorse the use of AMH for uh, control ovarian stimulation baseline testing. And again, it's a very useful test in this scenario. And again, like I said, the cutoffs less than one suggestive of poor outcome more than 3.36 or more than 3.5 suggestive of potentiality of multiple pregnancies. Okay, now, you know, the unknown, AMH and the male fertility. Remember this, like I told you this, AMH is a marker of certainly cell function in men, right? This is the, uh, again, this is another take home today, which you have to kind of understand, right? It's not a marker of leading cell function. Testosterone is a marker of a leading cell function, right? So keep that in mind. But so, so if you combine a testosterone and AMH in men, we actually get the complete picture of the male fertility, right? That's the interesting thing. Uh, in cases like, for example, in Klinefelter syndrome or varicocele, where there is certainly cell injury, which also happens. Initially, there is an, you know, uprise of the AMH, but then there's a gradual reduction of AMH, right? So if you're seeing a Klinefelter or a, you know, a varicocele, which has been there for a long time, it keeps reducing further. Over a period of time, AMH then correlates with the fertility outcome in males and lower the value poor the fertility outcome. So I think this is where, again, there could be potential use. The problem, again, we do not have standardized cutoffs. We do not have standardized data, but it's an area of research, active research. Again, you know, anybody uh, interested in doing this, this is an area we should probably look at. 
And cryptocurrency undescended testers, this is where it's useful for us. Uh, the AMH levels, you know, the, these young boys who come to us and they often refer to us, you know, uh, we have to kind of look at it, treat it, prognosticate them, everything, right? And AMH does correlate with poor fertility outcome in these cases as well. So it's a useful test in a sense to predict in men as well, uh, not just in women. But I think, again, the problem here is that we still need to develop the standardized cutoffs. Uh, does it have a role in pediatric endocrinology in general? Yes, we have a, you know, one of the biggest challenges uh, in, uh, you know, young hypogonadal children uh, is that AMH is useful for differentiating what is known as CDGP, that is constitutional delay from hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism in boys. And CDGP is something, you know, where there is a delay in puberty, but eventually the child has the normal puberty, uh, but it's late, right? In CDGP, the AMH is absolutely normal since the Certainly cell function is normal, but in hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism male, that is the Kalman syndrome or its variants, the AMH level is low. So I think this is something you need to be useful. Uh, you know, you can perhaps use that as a very useful test in young boys. So uh, then, of course, you know, the AMH use in PCOS, again, an area of extreme controversy, but an emerging area nonetheless. Right. What is the basis for that? And I think this is where really AMH is really picking up in terms of an essay. Uh, for both for uh, you know gynecologists as well as endocrinologists remember amh is produced by small enteral follicles and these are the same ones which you see on an ultrasound on a pcos and ams sense is a very good marker a surrogate biochemical marker for pcos you remove the human part of it you know the operator dependence and so on and so forth that is where it's useful uh, what about pcos and fertility well of course you know uh, there are no cutoffs which are strongly determined so amh can be used for deciding the ovulation induction protocol for infertile women and like I said, you know, to prevent uh, ovarian hyperstimulation, this is again, these are the group of women where OHHS is, you know, is, is very uh, important. And I think, you know, that is where again, uh, uh, you know, AMH could be a useful test. Uh, does it help in predicting the efficacy of OCPLs? You already discussed that women on OCPLs, the AMH will be lower. Uh, so it could be potentially useful, right? But the data is relatively limited. Uh, you know, remember AMH, like I said, OCPLs should reduce the AMH levels. Uh, but again, you know, weight loss also should normalize the AMH in obese PCOS women. Uh, but then again, you know, uh, there is some role of metformin as well. But for predicting the treatment outcomes in PCOS, this is an emerging area of research, but we still don't have cutoffs once again, right? So again, this is an area where really, I think this is really useful in practice. But I think we are still uh, far away from having a good data for that. Uh, the problem, I think, and this is, I'll give you a solution to this as well. Remember, when you measure an AMH, you're not just measuring an AMH, you're also measuring the AMH precursor. Uh, basically, what you get in an AMH report is the active AMH and the precursor, which is inactive, right, which is a longer circulating half-life. Now, there are ways in which you can actually measure just the active AMH. And this could predict, uh, you know, what you do is you use, uh, you know, uh, agent to sort of suppress the uh, inactive AMH and just, you know, remove that. And... What studies are now found is that the active AMH actually has good outcome in correlation with the PCOS follow. -up. So, you know, at this point of time, we still have, again, emerging data. But what it looks like is that an active AMH may be a useful test for predicting PCOS treatment outcomes and also has good correlation with the other metabolic parameters like insulin resistance and so on and so forth. Right. So I think perhaps this is the one where, you know, you would really... Uh, you know, see that, you know, you start the patient, you ma measure the active AMH, you treat the patient with metformin, yosipils and so on. And then you see that, you know, the active AMH is reducing. You see that perhaps the, you know, the lady is doing really well on treatment. Uh, is there an Indian data for diagnostic as part? We discussed this in the last meeting as well. Uh, remember, this is a study which was published in uh, uh, Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism from AIMS. And what they found was that, you know, they found that mean AMH was about 10 in the study group which had PCOS versus 2.5 in the control group and the cutoff of about 5.5 was uh, derived as a potential cutoff for use in AMH. So I think again in practice, remember this might be a different essay from what your lab is using but on, an, on a gross level, perhaps a level of more than 5.5 is very strongly predictive of PCOS and perhaps this, this test could replace your, you know, your transabdominal or transvaginal ultrasound from a diagnostic perspective in PCOS. Right? That's the uh, broad idea. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, it has, of course, role in onco fertility as well. Uh, again, you know, it can predict. It's an important use. But like I said, it's still an emerging area. But again, something, you know, we'll really look, like to look at. Uh, is it useful in uh, tumors? Well, granulosa cell tumors, uh, 
you know, and Sertoli cell tumors in men. Uh, these are important because AMH, these are the ones which produce AMH and they are important because they, of course, you know, predict the uh, outcome of malignancy and higher AMH would mean poor prognosis. Uh, some people say AMH also may be involved in the pathogenesis, remember, you know, so that's the idea. Uh, remember, it, it prevents atresia, right? And in cancer, you know, you want atresia, right? It, you know, kind of, you know, evergreens it. Uh, it's also useful for detecting recurrence after surgery. These tumors perhaps have poor outcome as well. And remember, AMH is also size dependent. So up till 10 centimeter of uh, granulosa cell tumors, you'll have high AMH. But if it's more than 10, you will have false negative values, right? So you might have AMH negative tumors, right? So it's a useful test. I've often be, I been mean, asked by, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, keep doing AMH uh, in, in uh, you know, PCOS women. And sometimes values are extremely high. And then, you know, women read up on Google and they find that, you know, do I have a tumor? Right? The answer is actually no, right? Uh, it's not a diagnostic test. It's more of a, you know, in women with granulosa cell tumor, it's a useful prognostic test. So I just summarize some take home messages. Remember, AMH is produced by granulosa cell in women. Uh, it starts at about 36 weeks of life. It's produced by Sertoli cell in men, which starts at about nine weeks of life. Uh, AMH essay lacks standardization. I think this is the biggest hurdle. Uh, and, you know, this is the biggest challenge. And I think we should be able to solve this in due course. Uh, it can be measured at any time of the day, any part of the cycle, which makes it a very attractive uh, uh, test. Uh, remember, OCPIL, women on OCPIL, the AMH values may be lower. Uh, it's a very important test for measurement of ovarian reserve, but in infertile women, and do not use it in normal fertile women, do not use it for predicting pregnancy outcome, which is it is not used that used for. Uh, it's also uh, AMH less than 0.5 to 1.1. It strongly suggests to wear ovarian reserve. More than 5.5 may be a useful test in Indian women for PC, diagnosis of PCOS. So useful tumor marker for granular cell tumor in women and Sertoli cell tumors in men. Finally, uh, if you're interested in more in endocrinology, we have this app free of charge. You know, uh, we have a lot of female infertility uh, issues. And I think, like I said, it's cross speciality, right? Uh, you know, uh, endocrinologists are equally interested and involved in fertility, both men and women. Right. Uh, and, and I think, you know, and for, you know, we talked about uh, fertility preservation. I think it's very important. One more thing, you know, you have a lot of pituitary tumors and young men with pituitary tumors. You know, I think neurosurgeons also need to be counseled that uh, they also have fertility preservation because they do, a, uh, you know, make this men pan hypopet and then keep chasing their, you know, uh, HCGs and HMGs and, you know, keep giving them. And unfortunately, the outcome may not be so good. So uh, that's, again, an area where we really need to look at and work together. Thank you. Uh, I am sure the audience was uh, sitting in rapt attention for your talk as usual. So I need not say anything more. You have excellently highlighted the importance and the right take home away messages of highlighting the importance of using it as an uh, essay uh, for only ovarian reserve and not predicting uh, pregnancy. Thank you so much. It was an excellent talk. All the three uh, talks were excellent. And I would uh, request the chairpersons to hand over the mementos to the speakers. Hithal with the mementos. And I would also request Dr. Jagruti Patel and Dr. Kashmira Shah to come on the dais to hand over mementos to the chairpersons. And Dr. Kashmira Shah.